You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. And welcome back, Los Angeles, to the LA Football Show. My name is Ryan Dyer, co-host with the madman, Jamal Madney. Uh, thank you if you are on radio, AM the Mighty 1090 ESPN Radio. If you're on podcast, Chargers fans, what's up? Welcome to the Chargers edition of the LA Football Show. Excited to uh, get into the bolts. A lot of hype around this team, a lot of excitement around this team, and rightfully so. First, let's welcome back in to the show my co-host. What's up, brother? Welcome back from the break. How we doing? Doing well, Ryan. Excited to talk Bolt fam here. You know, this is this day one, week one of what could be a very magical season for the Chargers, a historic one. Is this the beginning of a very long journey deep into January and perhaps early February? Excited to jump into it with you. Yeah, camp's underway. Uh, Wednesday, I was there. Thursday, Skinny T was there. Or I should say Wednesday, myself, Dan, and Jake were all there. Um, the three of us were there. We were able to interview Rashawn Slater. Um, that's up on all channels as well. So check that out. The great Rashawn Slater back from injury. Dude's got dude's thighs are the size of my entire like body. It's <laughs> unreal. Um, but the crowd was large. I don't know. I said on on our recap show we did, like, I don't know if they do like sellouts for training camp, but if they did, it would have been sold out. I mean, the bleachers were completely full. It was standing room only. Um, so so cool to see. And obviously the 262 point. Five million dollar arm was in attendance, slinging it all over the yard. So let's start with that, and then we'll get into some other maybe takeaways. But me and you haven't really talked since the news broke on Tuesday Eve, the day before tr- training camp began, that Justin Herbert became the highest paid quarterback in NFL history, at least for now. But he he holds that degree for now. About uh what is it, fifty two point five million per season is the average. Um almost two hundred nineteen total in uh guarantees. So just your thoughts on uh the we had no doubt it was gonna happen, but just your thoughts on the fact the deal got done. He's the highest paid and uh now we can get back to football talk. Well I think it's a it's a week of tremendous celebration and relief for the Bold fam to lock up their franchise piece for the next half decade. And I think it worked out very seamlessly. I think you see the market, Ryan, inching along here. You know, it started with Jalen Hurts, and then it was Lamar Jackson, and now it's Justin Herbert, you know, started five years, 250, and it's a couple million more moving along. And and Herbert, obviously, the, the richest guy in the NFL for now. Burrow probably will get a couple more million than he does, and we're just sort of inching along I think it also shows just how out of left field that Deshaun Watson contract was. And you and I have talked about that for quite some time now. But the market has yeah. really, I think, firmly set for the quarterback position. And now the Chargers have this uh, this long-term stability. They have their anchor. They have their franchise player here for the long term. And now you can sort of build in terms of trades, free agencies, player development, and you know, always start your pitch with – the guy with arguably the best arm in the NFL is, is locked up with us for the next half decade. So I think this is just a great day and a week for, for Chargers fans. He is the franchise. He's the future of the, the, the franchise. And now the question becomes, okay, the ink is dry. Let's maximize these five years. This is year one. It's all about production on the field. It's leadership for me off the field, his locker room presence, his presence in the huddle, his ability to galvanize his team both in times of success as well as in times of failure and how it all comes together. I expect him to be a top three to five candidate for MVP this year. I think anything less than that would be a significant disappointment. So now the Chargers have done what they needed to do on their end. And truthfully, Ryan, I think they kind of got him at a little bit of a bargain. I mean, the fact that the quarterback market isn't as crazy as that is to sound, the fact that the quarterback market isn't like moving as fast. It's like two, mm-hmm. three million more than the last guy. You and I had some conversations and said, you know, do you go and make the Mahomes move, you know, and you give him 10 and just give them more, you know, in terms of guaranteed money. Is there an equity play for with the team? I mean, you know, there was some bigger picture thinking, but I think the Spanos family did what they could do. I think they were very pleased. I think that they were able to stay within five years and not have to sort of break the bank in air quotes significantly more than what Hurts got or what Lamar Jackson got. It was 
they were able to kind of stay within the box of expectations. Herbert was happy. He said this is the team that he's always wanted to play for. This is where he's wanted to be. And I think the Spanos family is happy that it wasn't some left field contract that would have really kind of significantly cash strapped them from a liquidation perspective. So I think it's a win-win all around. And now it's time to see it on the field. Yeah, currently Herbert fourth in MVP odds at plus 1,100. Yeah. Um, so right where you said that three to five uh, range, and that's where Vegas sees him as well. You know, it's I agree with everything you said. I don't need to echo too much of it, but it's funny when talking – sports contracts in general and everyone and rightfully so, but everyone is like, you know, always in awe of like the, the amount and the millions. And, um, but you have to, at least when what we're doing and not just, you know, sitting at a bar drinking, but if we're like talking kind of analytically about it, you have to throw the millions out like the million acronym behind it. And then you really are just have to play it in terms of market value of what said business is paying. And so it's like, you can't compare, a quarterback contract to a banker who makes, you know, 90 K a year. It's just, it doesn't work like that, but it definitely the human element. Sometimes when you're like, I'm not saying you, but when you sit back and it's like, man, he just had, and I'm not saying he did this, but it's like had to hold out for that extra 500 K a year to have more, which in that contract seems like nothing. But for someone like me and you, I'm like 500 K a year. I would, I'm quitting everything. And that's my next job forever. (laughs) I'm good. So um, but hats off to Herbert, uh, well-deserved. And, and I think uh, it's good. He's happy and relieved to put it behind him and, and just get to play football. He talked on Wednesday, uh, to media and just, I thought it was cool that he was like, you know what, this is the only place I've only ever, I've only, I've only ever wanted to play here. Uh, even since I'm paraphrasing, even since I was a kid. So it, it was cool that kind of, he basically was like, I'm where I want to be. Um, I'm so appreciative of the organization for taking care of me and, and, showing that this is where they want me to be and and now we can just you know look to winning a championship so um yeah yeah Ryan. i mean you know it's it's so interesting your earlier point and i i'm really happy you brought it up very thought provoking there and i think the, the the fans obviously there's this sort of notion of you know everyday life is very challenging these guys get millions of dollars sort of playing a game and throwing a ball around and having fun which is all true but you have to look at it from the lens of Justin Herbert is there's literally, you can have only one hand. Okay. The guys on one hand that are arguably better than Justin Herbert at what he does. And so when you, when you look at any industry, whether that is tech, whether that is entertainment, whether that is finance, whether that is, you know, on and on the list, if you talk about the truly like five or 10 best people in that profession, they're all making that kind of money. And arguably the football players are actually kind of making less. Like for instance, the CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai made $200 million last year. You know, yeah. the CEO of Microsoft makes $200 million. When, when you, and when you talk about it as a tech executive, they are the best at what they do. The CEO of Disney is worth three quarters of a billion dollars. I mean, So when you talk about everyone sort of compares the 90K banker, the 90K banker might be the the 300,000th best banker. But if you take the best banker, like a la Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon makes about $200 million a year. So, you know, in that sense, you know, Herbert's almost sort of underpaid for how good he is relative to his profession. So I think it's important that we always sort of compare apples to apples. It's really hard to compare the best, literally the best person in one field to an average person in another field. You have to sort of level it out. There was an interesting podcast I was listening to, uh, Ryan, the other day. It was, it was a clip, and it was this tennis player, and he was ranked maybe 250th in the world, which is like mm-hmm. a really high ranking. And the guy said, I make $62,000 a year and my costs are $75,000 a year. So I'm losing $13,000 a year. I am like as good at, and the, the gap between a top five tennis player and a top 250 tennis player is so narrow, is so small. But yeah. look at Rafa and look at Roger and look at Djokovic and Alcaraz compared to, you know, the guy who's ranked 250. I mean, it's a, it's a power curve. It's, it's a huge distribution Mm -hmm. there in terms of difference so that's the way that's our country that's sort of capitalism at its best where the absolute best probably get a little bit too much 
and everybody else doesn't get enough, but that's just the way the curve is in every industry. So I think it's, it's also important to compare at, you know, average folks in one field versus average folks in another field and the absolute best in one field with the absolute best in the other field. Now, you know, professional athletes still make a ton, you know, even the kind of on average, but I think, yeah. you know, it's a little bit more digestible when you go kind of the guy who's like a backup wide receiver compared to kind of an average banker versus a Justin Herbert, the more appropriate comparison there would be a Jamie Knight. It's a, it's a great uh, way to put it. And that's, you know, it, it's, I think it can help people when you, when you think about that. Cause I think there's obviously when you're a fan, you want your, your players to stick around. Obviously that requires money and whatnot, but I feel like so many fans and I used to do this a lot more until I got to know a lot of the players is you almost just get, you see the money, you get a little disgusted, but then also like when players leave, you're like, Oh, you're so greedy. Like where's the loyalty? Where's this? And, and it's just, when you compare it to that of like, you're the best in your industry, you're going to go where you're most valued and whatnot. Then it, it does make a lot more sense or it makes it easier to wrap your head around. Like for instance, in our industry, we could talk about us versus Pat McAfee, like, yeah. guys yeah. guys better than us he's gonna make a lot more than us because that's how good he is he's built that brand up and so he is worth that kind of money and obviously our industry is different because you know our we make money based on brands wanting to be associated with us which i guess is like sports too but um anyway but it's, at the end of the day ryan i mean it's performance it's performance relative yeah. to how your industry is measured and yeah. you know in the case of a pat mcafee you know, Pat McAfee, you know, in our industry, in terms of kind of the, the new media is kind of like the equivalent of Mahomes. And you and I are probably, you know, I don't know what the, the quarterback comp is with you and me. Maybe we're, you Stetson know, Bennett. maybe we're Stetson Bennett, you know, and uh, so it, Max it's, Duggan uh, for Chargers. Max right? Duggan, Max baby. Duggan. Here we go. You know, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll eventually be uh, Patrick Mahomes. But, you know, it, it's sort of if you kind of draw that line and that curve across every industry and kind of are honest about where you are in that curve, you know, all of a sudden those gaps become smaller, you know, by yeah. orders of magnitude. I'm not saying they're equal. I'm not saying they're equitable by any stretch, but it is hard to sort of compare the absolute best. Like, I mean, it's literally like Mahomes, Burrow, Allen, Herbert, you know I mean? It's like, and now, you know, Hertz had a great year. I mean, it's like four or five guys. It's on one hand right now who the best quarterback in, in football is. And when you sort of back that out of how hard it is to make the NFL versus how hard it is to make college versus how hard it is to start on your high school team, when you're starting from that point of departure and you're saying, regardless of age, I mean, there are guys who are 10, 15 years older than Herbert, you know, and so any guy from 22 to 42, you know, there's five guys, you know, over the last 20 years who are as good as Justin Herbert. When you sort of look at it from that lens, it's like, yeah, you know, Pick, pick any other industry. Pick the top director, pick the top producer, the top investment banker, the top private equity guy, the top tech executive. It's all about that, you know? So yeah. it's just important for our, our fans to think about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, if, if we can be the Chase Daniel of podcasters, I will gladly take that. I will be happy to be <laughs> Bring the Bring it Chase on, Daniel. absolutely. 100%. Um, still a free agent, by the way, currently. So we'll see if he gets picked up, uh, especially with this Joe Burrow news, unfortunately, uh, getting injured in training camp on Thursday. Uh, speedy recovery to him doesn't seem like it's catastrophic, so that's good. Um, but anyway, back to the Chargers. So yeah, great. Herbert, hats off. Locked in for another, I guess, five-year extension, so six years total starting for right now. And um, he's the face of the league, face or face of the franchise one of the faces of the league can become the face of the city if things go well. And, and as charger fans and the chargers organization hopes um, so good to have him locked in. So in terms of the rest of camp, I'll kind of, since I was there yesterday, I'll say some things I, and would love to just kind of get your thoughts on it. Um, one major takeaway I had, and there was a few, uh, but what Kellen Moore has already done with this offense is really exciting. I mean, you could tell a immediate difference in one day, how much more fun this offense is versus the last two years of training camps under Joe Lombardi. And I, I think it's, you know, different kind of concepts in terms of how they're using receivers. I think moving receivers around, we've seen Mike Williams line up in the slot a little bit early in camp and um, what they're, you know, Kellen Moore's, schematically does so good at opening up the middle of the field. And we saw Justin Herbert just feast on that yesterday in those, you know, 11 on 11 drills, seven on seven drills, you know, Keenan Allen, 
looked like the best I've seen Ken Allen look in training camp for quite some time. My other takeaway was Quentin Johnson looks legit. And I know it's early pads aren't on yet. Um, but the size, the speed, the right running ability, watching what he does in and out of his breaks, um, watching closer, you know, I played receiver, so I really love watching receivers and his footwork I think is tremendous. Uh, and so just the, the combination of Kellen Moore's offense, um, obviously Justin Herbert being who he is and now having the, the monkey off his back and he can just focus on football and then just having a Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Quentin Johnson, Joshua Palmer. I mean, that is a lethal starting four receivers that Kellen Moore gets to play with. So I think Chargers fans got to be so excited about what this offense will be. I mean, it can't be much more boring than it was the last two years, um, but it's going to be not only not boring, it's going to be exciting, explosive, and dynamic. So Again, it's only been two days, but I think there's a lot to be excited about what this offense is from what we've seen so far in Costa Mesa. Right. I mean, what you're describing is scary, right? I mean, I think that's the the word I would use for the Chargers offense when you talk about, you know, and obviously there's been some some criticism uh, about Quentin Johnson and that selection, given who else was on the board. So obviously we want to see that kind of translate into the regular season. But when you talk about versatility in terms of his size, his speed, and then you you package that with Mike Will, you package that with obviously Keenan Allen, Joshua Palmer, but then also, you know, Davis and and you know and, and everything that they've got going on over there. So I think that this is a scary kind of offense. And then you know, we haven't even really talked about the tight end room at all either. So I, I think there's just so many toys to play with here that the Chargers should be a top five offense this year. I mean, I, I think that's kind of the baseline to to be very honest with you. When you're talking about how talented your quarterback is in, in uh, Justin Herbert and then all of these weapons. I, mean, I think it's going to be really hard to stay with the Chargers offensively and, and be able to score enough points. And as long as the defense is sort of average, I mean, this is a team that you feels like they can kind of win every game. It's going to be really remarkable to see. I think they're really going to push the Chiefs. And I think, you know, that's the team, obviously, they're, everyone is chasing. But, I, I mean, it's it's early. It's the first week of camp, but man, you know, and especially, you know, I hope everything is fine with Joe Burrow. I'm a huge Joe Burrow fan as Ryan, as you know, I hope he's healthy hundred percent, but in any event of Joe, Joe Burrow, like can't go if any, you know, God forbid, God forbid, this is a season ender. I mean, now all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of like, well, it's just kind of the chiefs and the bills and, and the chargers start, you know, slotting up in terms of the AFC. You don't want it to be done like that, but, you know, that, that may be a scenario here. And so I think Chargers fans have every right to have very, very high expectations this year. And, and now it's time to deliver. And Brandon Staley now has everything, Ryan. You know, he's got yeah. everything that he can possibly imagine on offense. He is a defensive guy. If this team cannot get to the divisional or to an AFC championship game, you really have to wonder if, if this guy's the coach for the long term. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to be what this test is. You know, I've always said kind of year three is where you can truly, I don't want to say learn, you learn a lot through the first two years, but year three is like the, the final exam, if you will, like, is this going to be a passing grade or is it not a passing grade? And so he's now made decisions. He's, you know, changed special court, uh, special teams coordinator after his first year, Ryan Ficken ended up being a slam dunk hire last year, really improved the special teams. He finally decided to change offense quarters last year, brings in Kel Moore. Seems like it's going to be a, a slam dunk hire and we'll get the offense going. And then now if he can get his defense doing what we all know he's capable of after coming from the Fangio tree and seeing what he did in 2020 with the Rams, then this thing should be a really well-oiled machine. And, you know, we were joking at camp, me, Dan and Jake, like when you look at the secondary, we'll, we'll wrap up with some defensive talk as we get, um, as we're getting up on time here, just two years ago, Jamal, just two years ago. So his first season as coach, the team that he inherited when they played the Minnesota Vikings, DeAndre Campbell was covering Justin Jefferson, who's arguably the best receiver in football. And now you're, you know, your corner four is more talented what the, than what yeah. they had then. Probably corner five is more talented what they had then. Plus, they have more depth at safety. You know, there's still that question mark. Is Alohi Gilman truly going to be the starter alongside Derwin James? Are we going to see JT Woods, Mark Webb, or others step up? But they at least have some depth there. I've always said all along, Brandon Staley views them as DBs, not corners or safeties. They want to be interchangeable. Jossier Taylor looks like one of the biggest steals of the draft last year, which what he's done, and they want to use him in that star and nickel role. 
And, and then obviously just the continued growth and maturation of Asante Samuel Jr. Mike Davis had his resurgence again last year. He looks great. And then obviously if JC Jackson, who was on the field practicing with the helmet on doing drills, wasn't full 100%, but obviously was a participant all throughout practice. It's like this room is everything Brandon Staley wants and needs. And now it's about him getting them to play their biggest ability. And then the biggest thing we talked a lot about last year is just guys executing. Cause there was a lot of times last year where the scheme was sound players in the right position and they just didn't execute. So if they can do that, um, I mean, this is a scary group from, from the offensive line to the safety, to the defensive line. I mean, there is talent up and down this roster and you know, it's just, it's going to be really exciting Jamal to watch all through camp, how they keep putting together, how some of these, I think this is, out like the Rams, there's so many questions. The Chargers, it's like a few players here and there. Who's the third spot? Who's the second spot? Starters are all kind of known, but it'll be really fun to just see this this team really just button up and you know get ready for week one against Miami, which should be a lot of fireworks. Absolutely, Ryan. And I mean, to me, it feels like Eagles, Bills, Chargers are the three most talented teams in football. I mean, yeah. I, I don't talent. think the Chiefs are. I just think Mahomes is that great. But the top yeah. to bottom, I think it's Eagles, Bills, Chargers. And so, you know, I mean, this is a top three football team in talent. So this is huge expectations this year. Totally agree. Totally agree. So we will have coverage for you all training camp long, all season long. Obviously, we had it all off season long uh, here on the L.A. Football Show on the L.A. Football Network. You can check out Chargers Unleashed for Chargers specific. Uh, we got to take a quick break on radio. We'll be back with college talk going Bruins and Trojans. If you're on podcast, Bolt fam, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you all next week. You're listening to the L.A. Football Podcast.